<laughs> Blatant disregard for the rules. <laughs> My candle just detonated out of nowhere. <laughs> How the f does that happen? I'll drop trowel again. Carter goes naked on stream. <laughs> <laughs> Forward or backwards for Adidas? I mean, dropping Kanye and then gaining D3 Young. <laughs> Boys are back. Boys are back in town. We uh we got a great crew. We got Big Bet Barter, Pete Wheeler, David Big D3 Youngs. We got Hoax Slice and Sebo. Uh, we got a special guest coming on in just a bit, um, Oliver Summers. But first thing I want to get into is that there's a little bit of drama between Nick Kyrgios and Boris Becker in the news. Did you guys see that? Uh, see the drama? My take's pretty simple. I, I don't think I can regurgitate what he said. So if, if you got it, just give your unfiltered, just like what what happened, and then we'll give our takes. Yeah. So I'll read it off here. So essentially, Nick Kyrgios, you know, was essentially saying the old game of tennis is a lot different than the new game, new game of tennis. And guys like Boris Becker, you know, the old heads wouldn't be able to compete with the modern day tennis player. And they've been going back and forth for like six or seven days now, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so Boris Becker, uh, he tweeted, Nick makes a lot of noise about tennis lately. Why does he speak about a sport he apparently hates? Fact check. Nick has never won a major championship as a player or coach. Yes, doubles won. So where is any credibility coming from? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so there's just this unfiltered drama between these two. Um, I love it going into the Australian Open, though. I, ha I had to comment on this on Cracked Rackets. I, like, yeah. went, at, I went at some, like, some dad. But uh, <laughs> first of all, like, old head take by Becker to just, like, not admit that like he could not compete with the top players today. Like not a chance. If he wants to make the point that they didn't have the technology and like they didn't you know, train like current professionals did, great. Like that's a cool caveat to throw in the argument that's, that's like based, but not a chance. Like saying that the speed isn't up to part or that the speed is up to part of today's game is like, just like not, like you're not being honest with yourself straight yeah. up. Yeah, and I would echo big bet. In the sense that, my goodness, yes, it's Boris Becker has more titles than Nick Kyrgios will ever win. Um, the fact that he says that Kyrgios doesn't have credibility is downright disrespectful and inaccurate. Um, because if we want to play the eras game, Kyrgios has played when there have been, th you know, three dominant players never seen in the game of tennis. Um, you know, so that's one check for him not having a singles major uh, title win. But also, I don't even, besides that, this is a high level player. He has grown the game of tennis. Um, and you know, yeah, if this take were coming from some hoedunk like myself or Isaac, sure, whatever. But like that's just downright disrespectful. And we see this across all sports. Um, baseball, for example, you see it. Um, in my opinion, Babe Ruth wouldn't even make double A in these days. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it's it's it, it's so true. Like that guy would he would suck. Um and it's just human beings are bigger, stronger, faster. Yes. The technology. Yeah. There's a lot more. We're not playing with wooden rackets. Strings have evolved um, and whatnot. Shoes, you name it. Um, but the game is just that much more competitive across all sports, uh, tennis being included. And so, I mean, Kyrgios is going to be Kyrgios and say things, but you know, yes, it may piss off, uh, you know, old geezer on Facebook, but it uh, it's accurate. You'd Babe Ruth get, would get rung up by any lanky submarine pitcher in Northern Arizona. You throw well, anyone on the ground against 1914 Babe Ruth, he's gone. Well, yeah, and he also is just playing against other out of shape white guys. <laughs> like you know, there, weren't, that. there weren't these super athletes from the D Dominican, you know, bombing 300, you know, 500 foot towers. I mean. They <laughs> Everything was racist back then. So, if Carlos from the bench warmers, he could play in today's game. Dude. Yeah. But yeah. You yeah. put Pablo Sanchez out there. <laughs> Dude, Rafi. Rafi from uh, Key and Peel. That guy, that guy would have been a Hall of Famer back in 1914. Oh, yeah. That's all American. Rafi, no. <laughs> See, but you're probably the most talented individual of, you know, of the folks here. Um, what's, what's your opinion on the, Curios and Boris Becker drama. Um, 
it's great entertainment for us. Like we get to see these two um, well-respected tennis players go at it. But my, you know, my real thing that I keep coming back to is like, honestly, who cares? Like they're having a debate that we have all the time. Like they're having a debate that's like, yes, they're going to have an opinion, but ultimately both are going to be correct and both are going to be incorrect in aspects. And remember, this is a guy in Kyrgios who hasn't played in a year. He's played one meaningful match. Like, yes, he's made a slam final. Yes, he's going to the game of tennis. But like right now, you can't say that he is like prominent in the sport. He, he hasn't played and he's not going to play in this upcoming Australian Open. And Becker's just coming off a, was it jail or prison in England for hiding assets? Like talk about two guys who like really, to me, it just kind of seems like are still trying to be relevant. Like Becker just joined Rune's team, but like he's not exactly a coach of Novak anymore. Like it's just to me, it just feels like two guys who are trying to be rele relevant. And I enjoy watching it. Don't get me wrong; it's not like I'm telling them to stop. But like ultimately, you know, who gives a tally ho fuck, as the children like to say? So <laughs> what's happening yeah. here is Rune's bitchitis is rubbing off on Becker. That's what's really happening. Becker's always kind of been that way, though. Actually, like even when he played, like he was a little bit of an asshole. Like and just I don't know. He kind of always had this arrogance about him. So, yeah. I mean, it's great for the neutral. I enjoy reading about the beef. And and you, we know that Kyrgios is like this when he's on social media. And, you know, but honestly, who cares? Like, they think this, they think that. They're both right. They're both wrong. Like, I, I can tell you right now who doesn't care, all of the other players who, who are prepping for 2024. Like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of want to throw someone into the mix. We'll we'll add Oliver Summers, Ollie Summers here. So Ollie, you heard a little bit of the debate. I'm curious your perspective. Well, first, welcome. Um, I'm curious your perspective. Probably what being able to watch, you know, more of those that old style, um, you know, Boris Becker era tennis. What are your thoughts on Kyrgios and his uh, and their I guess little debate and little drama there. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up watching uh, Becker in Edberg. I mean, I was probably about 10, 11 years old when those two were going back, you know, back and forth at Wimbledon. And uh, and Sebo's right, you know, Becker was a bit of a dick when he played. And, <laughs> uh, and that's what made it fun. You know, they had the rivalries. And I think they're actually very similar, Kyrgios and Becker, just different, different generations, but they're going about it the same way. I mean, I could easily see Kyrgios landing in, in jail or prison for doing something or other. You know, one of these days, and and I think I think Becker's doing it because he probably needs the money. I mean, he's the government's taken all the tax money he was uh, evaded or you know hoarding, and uh, I think he just needs a paycheck. How is he? How is he getting a paycheck from that? Well, I mean, by being relevant and by you know be, trying to be a coach still. Um, and I mean, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, prison has cleaned him up a little bit. Because if you look pre-prison, his face would always look so red and he would look, he, I mean, he looks in pretty rough shape. So hopefully he's a little bit cleaner nowadays than he was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, could be soaking up. Maybe he just wants to soak up those Twitter creator fees. Twitter pays creators now. C creators. <laughs> he's just going to have Twitter fingers from now on. Hopefully, hopefully this is the norm. Maybe Boris Becker is just going to start going after everyone. <laughs> would be great but, entertainment for us neutrals. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I want to know what uh, Pete Wheeler thinks about the stitch. Yeah. Uh, tough to <laughs> tough to add a whole bunch. I think, yeah, whenever you, like David was saying, whenever you compare errors in any sport, it it's a kind of a, a lose-lose because games seem to always improve or expand to fit the the rules and the you know, the technological advancements that different eras bring. It's like if basketball moved the rim to 12 feet tomorrow, you know, LeBron and MJ would still be great players, but it, it wouldn't be even a contest to whoever comes up in 2050 and is, you know, dropping 30 points a game on a 12 foot rim. So I think it's, I think it's the same in tennis and, Becker, I think Ollie's right too. Becker is probably the equivalent of a of a Kyrgios in in his era. So I think, yeah, let them have their fun, let them go at it. But we can we can just have a equal amount of fun 
talking about how it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> well, it's, I would add to it's fun to bring this debate to tennis because in the public sphere, this debate has existed in every other sport, LeBron versus Jordan. Um, you know, in baseball, it's the eras. Uh, in, in hockey, you've got the same thing. And not saying it hasn't happened in tennis, but, you know, maybe this will draw some more eyes on the sport, which, you know, you've always heard any press is good press. Not always true, but for the game of tennis, maybe this is good in the sense that it, it brings more eyes on the sport. Um, and so speaking of eyes, uh, Ollie, uh, you look dapper in your Christmas sweater. Uh, even you. more dapper is that Fulham FC uh, mm -hmm. football club for those uh, non-footballers out there uh, behind you there. Uh, we're in the middle of the Premier League season right now. Uh, for those who don't know, Ollie is uh, – a, an accomplished tennis professional uh, in Fargo Moorhead, uh, kind of the godfather of tennis in Fargo, kind of a Ted Lasso like figure, you could say. Mm. But, you know, let's just talk about, uh, you know, how are you doing? Uh, how are you feeling about Fulham? Uh, I want to get into talking a little bit about your, uh, you know, you're a journalist too now, getting on the Premier League TV network. Yeah, I mean, Fulham, uh, the Premier League channel, they're nice enough to uh, to let me on there whenever uh, Fulham have done something notable in the Premier League, which uh, isn't always very often. Um, for those of you who don't know Fulham FC, you should be Googling that right now and uh, finding out that we are very in a very gentrified neighborhood, middle class uh, football club. Um, that's we're just happy to be in the mix and happy to be playing in the in the big leagues. Um, but yeah, I run the uh, Fulham North Dakota fan club on Twitter. Um, and uh, that's how they found me. And they reached out to the supporters club and they're like, hey, does anyone want to come on and talk about Fulham? And uh, I raised my hand. I was like, yes, please. I'll do that any day of the week. <laughs> I'm going to start raising hell on the responses to all of Fulham <laughs> North Dakota's tweets. <laughs> <laughs> that would be That would be great. Hey, the more... We can get out there. Let's let's get some back and forth going. We need, you know, we, we wanted some stuff with some uh, Brentford and Chelsea fans. There was also uh, Southwest London teams all within about 10 square miles. So we'd love to get some uh, North Dakota fans of Brentford or Minnesota fans of Chelsea or whatever it might be. And so you should just, you should just start going crazy on that account and just shit posting about all the other teams in the in the Premier League, just roasting them left and right. Just yeah, let it go. All press is good press, right? That's right. Call That's a right. wanker. <laughs> see, the thing is, Fulham, they sort of, uh, they're, they're quite low key. Like I said, they're, they're a fairly gentrified club. So it definitely fits with, with my coaching style and my, my demeanor, where, where I'm probably not going to get into that too much. I'm just going to quietly go about my business and just be happy where I am. That's kind of, that's kind of Fulham to a T. And so, so Ollie, what would you say, like, um, Premier League, obviously it's one of the most, if not the most followed sporting league in the entire world uh, globally. Obviously, that's, I know you shared with me that that was one of the reasons why you were brought on was that they wanted to get an international perspective of the Premier League. What similarities do you see between soccer fans and tennis fans? And, you know, if you could provide, uh, you know, let's say you're a, you're a, you're a tennis player, uh, in, in the upper Midwest, you're, you're looking for a new sport to follow. The Vikings aren't doing it for you because God knows they suck. Um, you know, what's, what's the attraction? Uh, what's the bait that you put on the line? I think the thing with uh, football is it's just so uh, tribal. You know, you, you, get in, you get into the club and you meet other people all who are like-minded and you can find them around the world. Um, and they're all on the same page and you're, you're tr trying to go after the same thing. And I think that's, that's very similar with tennis. I mean, tennis is also very international and you have, you know, especially what I've found since I've been over here in, in the States is that um, players don't really, or fans don't really care if the, if the player is from, you know, their own country. Um, what I found in the UK is that, you know, you, you have to support all the, all the English, all the British tennis players, um, probably because we don't have very many. So we'll take all we can get. Um, and, uh, and and so you kind of that's that's kind of more tribal. But over here, you get fans who are just so enamored with with a Federer or with a Nadal, and then that's their tribe, you know. And and you see people on the tennis courts like me. I'm a Nadal fan, and found out you know he was making a comeback. So the next couple of days teaching, I was wearing my my Nadal shirt, 
you know so it's again it's like very tribal like i'm i'm a nadal guy there'll be a federer guy you know i think i think that's where it's that's where it's very it's fairly similar and it doesn't have to be from your own country you know it's just a player um that you you have an affinity with and that's the same in 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 soccer as well you find the club that you have an affinity with that you like some players on there and you and you like how they play and you like the manager and you like their style and and then and then you want to when you're playing that's who you want to be like whether it's soccer or tennis well said and you know i just want to ask you um you know in america we like winners 1776 yeah. great year for the country um so um England. you know we like the yankees we like the golden state warriors um what's that bandwagon team that uh, folks can hop on that's that's going to automatically win well it used to be it used to be man united the big joke was that uh, you know when man united got done playing the home fans would would be travel 4 hours back down to london um, because if you're a true Manchester fan, you're going to support Man City. Um, but, you know, all those teams are doing really well. Man, I mean, Man City right now, that's probably the bandwagon team. You can jump on them. They're going to have success. There's going to be a, a Chelsea. They're always going to be in the mix. You know, Liverpool, uh, Arsenal. If you never want to win any trophies, you're going to go with Tottenham because uh, they've always been, you know, top top five club and never won anything. But they've got a great uh, mascot. But, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, those, those are the bandwagon teams, but yeah, the thing about that's been not in the Ooh. Oh, <laughs> no, boo, let's boo him when he gets back. <laughs> British, hey. British Airways internet can't do it. British boo. Airways, internet. <laughs> <laughs> <A> bad internet, <laughs> British Airways internet. Sorry, You're, you got your, the internet just disconnected you, Ollie. Sorry. Oh, oh, okay. No, what I was saying, yeah, there's nothing better than supporting a team for years and years, and then finally they have success because then you feel like you've, you've stuck there with them for all that time. And I suppose in tennis, that's the same way if you support a young player and then you say, you, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, I think they're going to have some success. You know, maybe people have been th- thinking, hopefully, that uh, Tiafo is going to do something and. You know, if he ever does do anything, not that he will, he's never going to win anything. But, you know, if he ever does, so those who stuck with him, they're like, oh, yeah, see, I followed him from the beginning. Like, that's yeah. my guy. Of of the young guys now, who do you think has the most chance to win a major besides, you know, Alcaraz now that he has already won one? Uh, I'm going to go. Oh, that's a tough one because it's hard to think of any of those guys winning majors. Right. Other than Alcaraz, because <laughs> when when everyone else is gone, you're just like, well, Alcaraz is gonna it's gonna be there. He's gonna be the next one. He's probably gonna dominate. Uh, I'm gonna go with Jack Draper. Ooh, Ooh. lefty. Yeah. Just, what about this my Ollie. guy? Ollie, do you think do you think uh, Rune will get one major in his career? Yeah, I can see Rune getting a major. Yeah, I can see him getting a French. A French. Uh, it's probably a safe bet. Yeah, I think he's gonna get a French. He'll cramp up. Yeah, dude, Rune's solid <laughs> on clay. I, Isaac, Isaac. I mean, everyone knows Rune is just insufferable at times. But Isaac just – cold take, man, to think he will never win a major. He doesn't have the head to win a major. I, I actually – I completely agree. He's Here barely I, 20. I, so much as Vera. Like, <sighs> I don't know. I, I don't think Zverev's going to get it done either. I, I just – I think he's going to be like kind of like team was before he ended up, you know, getting <laughs> huge assists from Zverev on the choke in that in that COVID U.S. Open final. But I don't know. I just don't see him getting it done, I, especially if Alcaraz is healthy. I think I think Sinner is going to be like really tough as well. So hmm. Sinner definitely gets one at least. <sighs> and don't forget about my boy Ben Shelton either. No, <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I don't think he has the, I don't think he has the durability. Like he can get hot for, like we saw at the U.S. Open, he gets hot, but then he runs into like, or granted he runs into Djokovic, but yeah. I don't think he, I don't think he can beat enough of the big guys consistently to win a major. Not yet, at least. I, I think with Shelton, especially I think what he's going to have to do over the next few years is 
turn himself into like a physical freak like Monfils. You know, I, I think if he makes that next step, like athletically, because um, he's already a great athlete, but I think if he even makes that next step, like, I mean, on a fast, hard court, like, I, he, I could see him just hitting through people. Just just so he doesn't have to ever hit a backhand? Because his backhand is worse than, like, end-of-life Lou Gehrig. Not great, but it's no Cam Norris. Dude, Cam Norris backhand is sneaky good. Yeah, it doesn't it, look good on TV, but it's 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 got that like it, cheeky uh, underspin to it. It's a nightmare to deal with. I promise. Like yeah, well, Manorino is kind of that same way too. Oh, Manorino is a nightmare. Like Manorino, imagine having to beat Manorino in three out of five. Like that's a nightmare. God, yeah, that guy is so tricky he, to play. Yeah, Ollie, and we'll let you go after this question. You you brought up Rafa before, um, and you said you mentioned that he was one of your favorite players. Do you think he has a shot at, you know, making a run in the Australian Open? He's getting back. He was playing with Gasquet a little bit ago. No, I think he's got no shot. No, no shot? I I mean, I'd love to see him play, but at the same time, I'm going to be watching him, hoping that he doesn't hurt himself. Yeah. I mean, I think he's at that level. I'm just like, I feel like he's very fragile. And uh, hopefully he's back because he wants to be back. Like, I think he's a bit of a gambler. Like, he goes to the casinos and maybe he needs some money as well. But uh um, you know, I, I just I hope he enjoys his time, and but but I I really hurt for him watching him because like when he starts to limp or you know he, he takes the injury time out, I'm like okay, this is his knees probably hanging on by a thread. Like I can't imagine the the damage he's done to his body and his joints over all the years. So I just hope it, he's he's healthy at the end of it. That that's true. He, he's a he's like a gambler. He's a degen. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, big time. I mean, that's yeah. That's he. He's even said that he likes to go and, and, and place bets. And, you know, he, they, they said, like, when he, when he gets injured, he needs to do something to keep his competitive spirit going. So, I mean, he plays golf as well, but, but I think he likes to do a lot of sneaky bets as well. One of us. One <laughs> of us. I feel so good to be And Ollie, last, last question um, before we kick you off here. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it's the holiday season. We brought up. Soccer, football, as, as you folks from across the pond call it. Uh, Ted Lasso, you know, we talk about growing the Premier League in the United States. That show, I would imagine, had an immense impact on that. Um, you know, I know that you said when you watched Ted Lasso, you saw a lot of Ted in yourself. Um, you've got a fine mustache. You're a little quirky. Um, mm -hmm. You are happily married with a child. Uh, Ted, that's not necessarily the case. He does have a child, but he's not happily married. Um, but you know, Ted Lasso is known for his, his quirky, uh, his, his quotes, his euphorisms, um, and advice suggestions, which are typically good. And I think that people think that you give good advice too. So it's the holiday season. It's the Christmas season, Hanukkah, uh, Kwanzaa as well. Festivus, uh, was wondering if you had any advice, maybe a couple of tips for folks as they, as they go home for the holidays. Yeah. Um, uh, so how many do you want? How many tips do you want? Uh, as many as uh, you feel called to share. All right. Well, this one could be fairly pertinent. Um, I'd say if you have a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend come around for Christmas dinner, put them on the very end of the photo so they're easy to crop out for the future. <laughs> you, don't, you, yes. you don't want to ruin a good family photo with oh. someone that might not be sticking around. That's going to be my first piece of advice there. Um, do you, do you have some family photos from, from your days as a young lad where there are holes cut out? <laughs> no, I, I don't actually. No, I, I, we always did a smart thing and just kept it to family. So, yeah. yeah. And, I, and plus, I was um, not exactly great with the ladies. I, I went to an all-boys school. So, to be fair, I didn't have, um, you know, many chances to interact with, with females. Um, they didn't teach so I playing, playing some mixed doubles, but then I was like, you know, one of these really, really awkward kids who who didn't say a word to the to the girl. That was that was kind of me. Um, so yeah, I I kind of found my way in college a little bit more. Um, second piece of advice: your pants won't get too tight if you're not wearing any. Nice. So don't don't feel bad. Just unbuckle, take them off. You don't need them. Um, and I'd say the you know the elf on the shelf. Did you did, did any of you guys have that growing up? Do you guys have fond memories of Elf on the Shelf? Yeah. Because oh, yeah. from a from a from a parent's perspective, 
like it seems like a great idea and you're like oh yeah we're gonna do this every night we're gonna do this we're gonna like move the elf and be really creative with it but probably about like five days in you forget to do it once and then your kid comes down and is like where's why hasn't the elf moved and then invariably you're like well the elf was super tired he had a long night he, he just wasn't Paralysis. you know doing it so so i would say forget the elf on the shelf it's just gonna it's just gonna cause you problems it's just gonna be extra stress for the holidays and then that leads me on to my final piece of advice and that is don't feel pressure to have the perfect holiday so i'll give you an example like for us we felt always felt pressure to make make a big meal you know have a turkey with all the trimmings make up you know the table perfectly and then after a few years we're like you know this is no fun why don't why don't we just order food and then now <laughs> now that's our tradition so so you're on christmas day or well christmas eve because it's probably not open christmas day we're going to order a bunch of indian food because because we really like indian food and we're going to have a bunch of leftovers i mean uh and for thanksgiving we did chinese food and uh that would be my biggest piece of advice you know don't fret about what you see on social media just to have christmas in your own way it's there for you to enjoy it and uh don't don't feel like you're missing out. There you go. I love Hands it. Hands off. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I I feel empowered. Thank you for sharing all of our summers. Um, the final question that I have is that <laughs> the pants off. Um, when does that end? Like, uh, are you allowed to carry that into the workplace? Um, or is that strictly <laughs> just for the holidays? Well, I mean, I think it depends where you work. I mean, if you are. Uh, oh, you're my streaming, God. You, you, you could be pantless right now. Right, any one of us could be pantless. We don't know. Uh, Maybe harder? that could be a question for the audience. You know, each week you pick. Okay, who's pantless this week? <laughs> I think, I think, that's I think a great a segment. segment. <laughs> yeah, that's a great bit. <laughs> I think I think I actually had my pants off in one episode that that was showed on the screen. Correct? It's in our intro. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, Ollie. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Keep up the good work, guys. Happy Boxing Day. <laughs> Isn't that Canadian, David? No, the Brits celebrate it too, I no, think. No, it's English. It's oh. English, yeah. Is it? They celebrate in England. My bad. <laughs> Dave, uh, so transitioning, I, I want to see this talent that you got. I, yeah, uh, I can stall for about two minutes. I've got a wardrobe that I need to – I had a wardrobe malfunction, and I need to get my lips ready. I need to get my lips ready. Um, <laughs> So one one thing that we want to implement in our regular episodes is potentially a member of of the crew will perform a talent for our our lovely audience. So this week, David Big D three Youngs will get the privilege of performing his talent. Um, but yeah, go yeah. Do, and so do. as I get ready, I would love to hear just from the crowd some some ideas that that you may have some some crazy talents that you've seen. Um, and I will put my mic and uh, camera back on when I'm ready. <laughs> I, I want to, I want Borat to show up when the camera comes. Yeah, <laughs> gotta be Borat. It's, it's Borat. Borat, it's gonna be Borat. He uh, he could easily pull out his trombone. Don't uh, don't put that past him. Oh. <laughs> if he does, if he does pull out his trombone, what do you think he's gonna play? Yeah, the, the oven smashing <laughs> He said he's warming up his lips, so Rick's definitely right. Yeah. I hope he – Borat doesn't – there aren't any songs in Borat. Borat doesn't have like a no. – actually, he does. He probably shouldn't say them on this channel, but – The um, <laughs> Kazakhstani national anthem. Oh, yeah. In, in Borat number one. <laughs> At the rodeo, then yeah. there's uh no 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 what we gonna do? Chop them up like the Saudis do. <laughs> What's that? One? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the Wuhan flu too. Four out is four out something. Um <laughs> David. I uh, Am I good to add you, David? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> like, what's going on? I can only see oh, this no. right now. But David, is are you sure you want me to add you? Like, <laughs> okay, he's giving me thumbs up. He's giving me thumbs up. Like, <laughs> no, what he is? <laughs> oh my God! Uh, All right. no Let's hear it. Very so, nice. Um, 
I just want to share real quick. Uh, my my passion for music runs deep. Um, it's actually how I made some of my friends that are on this call. Uh, Big Bet Barter and I shared the stage in middle school Allstate band, both trombonists. And then Eric Porter and I uh, at the North Dakota High School Allstate bands. We had a lot of great times together. I was principal trombone one year. I had an early exit due to food uh, born illness, uh, but I heard he did great. And so, yeah, I play the bone. Uh, I was going to try to find a cowboy hat, but I couldn't find it somewhere in a helmet. Um, it's the one that I normally wear around. Um, and, you know, we had Ollie on. And uh, he's obviously British. And I wanted to remind him when he watches this that America is supreme. So I'm going to be uh, performing <laughs> a rendition of our national anthem. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, please rise. So I apologize to our country. <laughs> um, that was no, I thought that was solid. Oh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did it help when you were playing with your shirt off? <laughs> uh, no, I just think that I thought that would add to the theatrical aspect of it. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'd love a second chance at some point uh, down the road to, to show that I was once a good boner. I know that Eric can yeah. testi uh, testify carter can as well but you know trying to get back into the gigging industry and i'm gonna need a little practice <laughs> um, I don't, I don't uh, be able to sleep tonight thinking about the troops <laughs> um well let's transition into our our next topic um so oh. sibo i'm kind of curious so there is some drama between Rune and Rublev, and you brought yes. that up in our text. <clears throat> I have no idea what happened. Can you ex can you explain what went went on between? Really, those? you didn't you didn't see this blowing up on the socials over the weekend. Um, so I don't know if you guys know, but there's this ultimate tennis showdown that is the brainchild of. I don't even want to say his name because he doesn't need any more publicity than he already has the snake who you can pay 
I think it was some obscene amount for like an hour private lesson and like private conversation with, I think it was in the region of like seven grand, I think it was, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but he was yeah. advertising that and I'm like, oh my God, get out. Anyway, so it's ultimate tennis showdown and these guys are playing with like totally different rules. It's four quarters, each eight minutes a piece. And you can have like these point cards that you can play to get yourself extra points during a quarter and things like that. It's just a total bunch of nonsense really. And Rublev is playing Runa and they're in the second set. It's like getting close to the end and Rublev tries to play a three point card to give himself three points just cause he can. And what ended up happening was the umpire mistakenly played it for Runa instead of Rublev. So then they play the next point. Rublev sees that he is not up in the scoreboard anymore. And he freaks out and he's like, he spends like five minutes like asking Moratoglu and like the umpire and the referee to like check the replay. And, you know, he's convinced that once they go back and see that, you know, they'll be able to reverse the scoreboard, give him the three points, and then, you know, carry on as normal. Runa puts on his headset because you have headset interviews in between quarters. He puts on his headset and goes, I don't know what happened. I didn't see it. This is all a shit show. Like, like things are just going on left and right. And I'm just sitting here thinking, what is the point of this? Like, they're playing and... They have like nicknames like Rublev is like Rublo and Runa is the Viking for no particular reason. I don't know why. And then Jack Draper ends up winning the whole thing somehow. Like I, I don't I don't really know what the whole purpose of this is, but it caused a big stir. And I was just like, why are we doing this? Like it kind of similar to the Kyrios Becker thing. I'm just sitting here like, what what's going on with our sport? Like this is supposed to be like the time where people are getting better. They're in Dubai, like training in the morning and sunshine and nice weather. But here we are in somewhere in London and Rublev is getting berated for acting like a child for no real reason. They're just like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah. It seemed, it seemed like that, that event was put on by like kids or something like that. Yeah. Seems like well, what you're describing is like, well, I want, I wonder, I wonder who was putting on that event and you can connect the dots as to why <laughs> things were quote unquote, a shit show. Well, or Boris Becker was in charge of it. <laughs> well, it's just like weird to watch too. Like, it's just the thing I'm just, ugh, the net's different. Like why yeah. is it like, it's like little stuff like that. It's like, it, it makes it look not serious. Like, these are the best players in the world. Why are they playing on a different net? Yeah. That's like that's like an NBA league, uh, like, on the offseason. Like, oh, we're just going to make the rims lower because whatever. It's like, it doesn't look serious. It's right. it's Morotoglu's attempt to, like, I'm guessing here. I don't know this for sure. But it's his attempt to, like, make tennis a more watchable, marketable product. And it's like... You don't really need to do that. Like, and plus it's at a weird time of the year when like, especially here in America, like the NBA season is in full swing, like football season is getting to like the playoffs time. Like people are going to be more concerned with that. Like hockey's in full flow. Like all the sports are like kind of happening right now. And like, you don't really need to try and like throw tennis into that mix. It just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And yeah. there's, there's at least like, there's so many different things that tennis can do to be more watchable. I think changing, and Isaac has talked about this, changing that camera angle. So you yes. can see, like, the break of these serves and the kickers. And just, because from that angle way above, you don't, you, you just don't see that in the sport. And you don't appreciate, like, A, how high over the net they're hitting and how fast they're hitting and how hard they're moving. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's literally a different product when you change the camera angle. I totally agree. And I then, agree with that, but like the common person watching a tennis match, that overhead view is the best view. Like it might not be an authentic view of like the spin and stuff, but it's so much easier to like track where the ball lands. And I think that's more important for a viewer is like, hey, did that ball go in or did that ball go out? Rather than like, hey, this guy's hitting a slice that's just insane. Well, yeah. here's a thought, like, because I, I see 
I hate to be the I see both sides guy. Um, but no, I mean, yes, Isaac, that's right. But also the way it's displayed right now to the masses does not articulate how difficult the sport is and how good these guys are. Yeah. Um, and girls. At this point. Yeah. So I would, I would just say, you know, what are your thoughts on an alternative cast, like a Manning cast for tennis? I don't know if tennis is big enough for that, but get a couple of guys on, get, you know, a, uh, get a McEnroe, get a, get somebody who's a big fan of tennis, like Jake Owen, country music star, big tennis guy, like get them on that cast, like with that view. I don't know. Jimmy Buckets. Jimmy Buckets. That dude yeah. loves tennis he and he, tennis. he'd be great for that. Yeah. I think the Manning cast works because you have like the brothers, like they, they bring something different than like a quote unquote, like classic announcer. And, but they also know the game. And I think Jimmy Buckets would be that because he doesn't really, to my knowledge, at least he doesn't really understand the, the nuances of like the etiquette of the sport. Like you're, your ESPN crew will like they they won't talk during the point or they won't like point things out that are glaringly obvious that might be detrimental to one player or the other. But Jimmy Buckets, what I feel like, would just tell it like it is. Who you know, who, who, who do you think the best? Tennis. Who do you think the most? Uh, who do you think's the best famous person that follows tennis? Jimmy Buckets is a good example. Like you got Red. Ben Stiller out there. You got Chad. Ben Stiller's a good one. Brad Pitt, tennis fan. Yeah, Brad Pitt. Tiger. Well, Tiger Woods was famously um, doing like the Rafa come on when the year he won it against Medvedev. If you remember that, right? Who yeah. um, also dated Azarenka for like ever too. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Wait, what? Red Foo, the, the FO, oh. FAO guy. Oh, I thought you said Tiger. Oh. Wait, <laughs> no. didn't didn't they have a kid together? Is is Azarenka's kid not Red Foo's? Oh, that might be. Are they still together? I don't know. No, they're not together, but I'm pretty sure that. I, I think that's right. Actually, I think they did have. A I think they might actually. I think that might be his kid. He's the the party rock anthem guy. The, the oh. huge Afro <laughs> guy from Party Rock. Yeah, oh, always actually got a picture of him uh, at BMP Paribas. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. But Could it be? I think uh, I think Roddick and Jimmy Buckets would be a sick pair. Roddick's, Roddick's a good Roddick's shout, good. actually. Roddick's yeah. a really oh. good shout. Yeah. I would agree with that too because Roddick has very I mean he's got a large social media presence um and I would say outside of tennis too um but he's very much in with it um obviously society moves forward like a freight train but like Andy Roddick gets that um and so yeah I think him Agassi could be another good one he's not as uh edgy as Roddick but like he's a well-known name I just think Agassi's a bit a bit boring, any he? like he just yeah. like when was the last time you saw him in the news apart from like all the great things he's doing for you know, like, like with his foundation, like with his foundation? Yeah, that's yeah, a very it's good great. Point. Like, it's, I'm not calling him like a bad person, he's just like he's not really like a TV <clears throat> personality, right? Like, yeah, that's very fair. Yeah, um, god, that's a good one. Like, who could we? Let me see. I think I think you you guys remember the video he posted where he's like walking to the court. He's like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna whoop your ass today." <laughs> oh, how about how about Chad Ocho Cinco? Yeah, that's oh, not a bad one. Fan. That's not a bad one. Yeah, and uh, he might he might bring his uh, his pal Unc Shannon Sharp to the show as well, which would be <laughs> just all time experience for everybody. Shannon Sharp and Shannon could maybe get Stephen A in. And <laughs> oh God, <laughs> say say goodbye to Quiet Please, because holy shit, that would be something. <laughs> How about a Boris Becker and Nick Curio show? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that'd be nice. Ooh. Ooh. Would they be in the same room doing this, or would they be on opposite sides of like the commentary booth? Just them and Patrick McEnroe playing mediator. Bro. Patrick McEnroe. <laughs> or or uh, what about BG Dale? to come or up with it, all their crazy nicknames and all that. Nah, Darren Kale's going to be courtside with Sinner. That's the problem. Sinner's going to be competing oh, yeah. for all the major titles. Yeah. I wanted to ask the group this because this is something I kind of heard consistently from like people who would come like – watch us play in college especially i think for the average person like doubles is way more fun to watch i think right because 
it's so much quicker and it's so much like faster. There's more overheads. Like, I wonder if like, because you do see some doubles, but I mean, all the doubles matches I can remember watching growing up is like the Bryan brothers. And like, that's basically all you ever saw. Like there are Mm -hmm. so many great doubles players out there. Uh, You think of guys who are like Leander Pays and, you know, um, the how old is he now? Like, Oh no, that's Bopana. Just kidding. Yeah. And Marcelo Mello. And then uh, you got, you know, guys like Buderak too. Like, I never saw any of those other guys on TV. And I think we're just missing a lot from the sport by not having those guys on there as well. I I don't know. I think that would make it because doubles is so different and it's such a big part of our sport as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. agree. Yeah, I would agree. And I think too, you know, we've always talked about like, how do you grow tennis? You know, we've talked about things like making like an equivalent of the three M open for tennis. Uh, which yes, Sibo, there would be noise. There would be noise when you're striking <laughs> tennis balls. I know you love that. Um, but uh, maybe doubles is the place to start with that, and um, it would probably require because you ask any rando on the street, they can't name any professional male doubles players right now besides the Bryan brothers. Which obviously that's that's a generation, or you know they're not there anymore. Um, but maybe you bring in like you know. Alcaraz to play in the tournament. Maybe you bring in Nadal. Maybe you bring in some of these bigger names that people know. Well, um, I also think too, like you ask the average person over the age of thirty, like what do you play? You play doubles, and you just don't see that at a high level on TV. I think that's honestly one thing. I'm going to say one thing that pickleball does really well is like you just see a lot, like on TV, you see a lot of doubles, like and and people relate to it really well because that's what they do. I, I don't know. I do with that what you will, but I, no, I I think that's one thing they get right with their with their they have uh, it seems like a better mix of singles and doubles. No, I would agree with that. Like I'll be honest with you, Matt. Like I I can recall when they had that like you know Sunday mornings they had pickleball on sometimes, and it was like a pro am. It was like Agassi, um, Roddick. Fuck, who else was it? There were a couple of like pros right? and like what Michael Chang. Chang. Yeah, it was Chang, and then yeah. who was the fourth? Um, oh, McEnroe. Sampras, maybe Mac. Yeah, Mac. It was McEnroe. You're right, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was intrigued by that, but let's say it was just, uh, you know, McEnroe versus Chang and singles and pickleball. I wouldn't watch that. And maybe that's something that tennis can take from pickleball because I don't know. It's, just, it's, there's people like action. Yeah. I, I, I have a solution that will solve fan engagement outright. It's foolproof. Um, not only will it solve for fan engagement, but it will most definitely solve uh, for world peace and and racism. And oh, that no. is what? Bringing, bringing in the 2022 UND men's tennis team to hype up players after they win a point and scream, come on. <laughs> <not really loud. laughs> That's a loud team, man. <laughs> That's a really loud team. Racism <laughs> over. Yep. Maybe in racism increased. I think that's a great way to end the show. Uh, yeah, that's we'll end it there. <laughs>